If you would take your Bibles with me this morning, we're going to start in Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. And before we, we uh, get to reading, I want to give you just a little bit of background because we're going to be jumping kind of in the middle of the story. So Esther opens up. We have the king. He has a banquet. He's married at this time to his wife named Vashti. And this is a pagan king. He's not a godly king. He's a pagan man. Vashti does not do what he wished. He asks her to do something very immoral, something that she shouldn't be doing anyway. She refuses. So he essentially, to put it in our vernacular, he divorces her. And he starts to decide, I'm going to hold a beauty contest. And I'm going to look for a, a new wife, a new queen to take Vashti's place. And that's kind of where we start our story in Esther chapter 2, starting in verse 4 and going to verse 7. It says, then, then let the young women who please the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. In Susan, the cit citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with the captives who had been captured with Jericho, uh, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment because this is very interesting to me. You have a man, Mordecai. He is the third generation that's lived in captivity. When you follow this lineage, his entire family history for three generations has been captive under a pagan king in one way or another. We see Nebuchadnezzar's name mentioned. Now he's not in Babylon, but he's in Persia. And all these horrible things that happen, you can imagine at that time being let off in the captivity what that means. That means you've lost everything at one point or another. Third generation, he may have earned some of it back. We see that with Mordecai. But at one point, they lost everything. You see Esther, whose father and her mother are gone. They're dead. She's being raised by an uncle. And at this point now, the king says, I want Esther. I want Hadassah. I want all the young women. So now Mordecai, third generation in captivity, not living in Jerusalem, not living among God's people, now has to give up his adopted daughter whom he loves to a pagan king seems like God's just taken everything from him doesn't it just stripped him clean there's nothing left but Mordecai submits anyway he submits and he turns Hadassah over now in all this when you continue reading in chapter 2 and verse 21 it says that in those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gate two of the king's eunuchs big thin and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on the king Azurus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. So here we see Esther's become queen, and what does Mordecai do? He saves the king's life. He tells him, there's a plot that's coming against you. This man is under captivity, has been for three generations. He's seen tons of injustice. He's seen horrible things done. He's lost his adopted daughter, uh, Esther. She doesn't even have her regular name. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah. He's lost her, and they changed her name to Esther. And he says, but you know what? I'm going to do good. I'm going to tell them that the king's life is in danger. And he warns them. Church, this is the very thing that we're challenged to do as Christian believers, to show a type of love that the world does not understand whatsoever and trust that God is able to do the impossible, even if we can't figure out what that impossible is at that time. As a matter of fact, in reading the Scripture, if you pair this with Jesus' command back in Luke chapter 6, hold your place here in Esther because I'm going to come right back. But if you take your Bibles and you look Back at Luke chapter 6, this is exactly what God commands us to do. In Luke chapter 6, looking at verse 27, verse 27 and going to verse 33, it says, But I say to you, 
I say to you who hear, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask for them back. And just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners do the same. Listen to those commandments from Christ. Those are not easy commands, but this is what God says to every single believer. This is what makes us different from the rest of the world. He says, I want you not to just love your friends. That's easy to do. I don't want you to just love your enemies. Again, that's okay. It's not easy, but I can love them from afar. But he says, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Man, he's taking it really far. He's saying when somebody gets on Facebook and starts blasting you, you can go on there and say, thank you. I love you. I don't see that much on Facebook. He tells them, he says, you've got to go the extra mile. Because in doing so, you're going to become a testimony. You're going to get their attention. They're going to see something different in you that the world cannot comprehend. Here, Mordecai is doing good to somebody who has been a part of his family's oppression for three generations. Who's got God's people under his thumb. And he says, I'm going to do good. This king has taken everything from Mordecai. Everything. For many of us here today, for such a situation, I'd probably want their plot to take place. Go ahead and get rid of him. I don't want him. But Mordecai didn't do that. You see, this is the challenge, church, is that we trust God in every situation, that we remove ourselves from the equation and say, God, this is yours. I trust what you're going to do. I trust what you're going to do, no matter what. This is why it's so important to spend time on our knees, to spend time in Scripture, because it builds up that spiritual man inside of us where we can say, I trust God. I trust Him. It's easy to say, I trust God when things are going my way. I trust Him just fine then. But when it seems like everything's falling apart, that's when it gets hard. That's when I want to step in. When I see a family member hurt, that's when I want to step in. When I see my kids getting the raw end of a deal, that's when I want to step in. But you look at this scripture, and that's not what scripture teaches, is it? It says to step back and let God take control. God's going to handle it. Remember, I say it every week, God loves you. If God loves you, he's going to defend you. Not in the way so much that you want, but in a way that's beyond what your expectations are. And we're going to see that with Mordecai, and we're going to see it with Esther and the Jewish people as we go further into this story. But when we go back to the book of Esther, go ahead and turn back there with me. After Mordecai saves the king's life, after he does this good, you would think the king would be so appreciative of what Mordecai did, and he was, to a degree. But it says that in chapter 3, verse 1, that he promoted a man named Haman. Now, Haman was an Agagite. He was an enemy of God's people. That's quite a name, isn't it? Agagite. You've got to really work to say that name. But he was an enemy of God's people. And much more so, when the king promoted him, he got paraded through the city. And people paid homage, gave him gifts, bowed down to him. Mordecai was a Jew. It was not permissible for him to bow down to anybody. He was willing to obey the governing authority. He was willing to do that, but to bow down was something entirely different. To pay homage was different. And he would not do that for Haman. When that happened, Haman became enraged. And he wanted vengeance. He wanted to lash out. But not just at Haman. He wanted to lash out at all the Jews. 
So here's what happened. In verse 8 of chapter 3, it says, Then Haman said to the king, the king of Xerxes, he says, There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different. Their laws are different uh, from other people's. And they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from, the, from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as sees good to you. Now wait a minute. Mordecai just saved this king's life. Mordecai is a Jew. He did something good. He saved the king from a plot. He's given the king his adopted daughter. He's given him his allegiance. He's a counselor to the king. He's done everything he's supposed to do. He's done nothing wrong. And the king repays this by saying, I give permission for you, for your family, for everyone to be slaughtered. Remember, the king doesn't know Esther's a Jew yet. Mordecai told her to hide that fact. So the king does not know. But he knows that Mordecai's a Jew. And he tells Haman, you can kill them all. What a slap in the face. You'd go home and say, you know what? I should not have told you about those fellows. They had the right idea. We should have ended this thing and been done with it. That's not God's plan. Church, remember, while God loves us, He doesn't work in ways that we understand. He works very differently than what our expectations are. To everything God does, there's a higher purpose. And it requires my trust and my allegiance to Him because I'm not always going to be able to figure it out. I'm not always going to be able to look down the road and say, okay, I see where the pieces are fitting. I see, God, what you're doing. God doesn't want me to do that because He wants me to walk by faith and not by sight. I have to be willing to trust God even when everything is falling apart around me. Notice that for Mordecai, again, for three generations, God did not deliver his people out of bondage. Mordecai's, great -grand, or, Mordecai's grandfather, father, and now Mordecai have all been in captivity. And I guarantee you, every one of them prayed for deliverance, and God did not give them deliverance. And now, at this point, Mordecai's life is on a clock it's not even in jeopardy it's on a clock there is a pointed time where the king has said you're going to die that's a scary time and you're still trusting in God Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6 buddy it's so powerful it tells us trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Those scriptures are saying, in everything I do, honor God. And after I've done everything to honor God, trust him. He'll give me the direction to go. Trust him and he will give me the direction to go. So here Mordecai's done everything to honor God. He's done everything that God has asked of him and more so. And now we've got the king throwing this at Mordecai, and he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do? So you go on down to chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes. He went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth and ashes. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and to take his sackcloth away from him. But he would not 
accept them. This is what Mordecai did. When all this happened, sackcloth and ashes in Old Testament time was a sign of mourning and grief. It was a sign of humbling yourself before the mighty hand of God. And here Mordecai, he doesn't just do this anywhere. He goes right in front of the king's gate, right where the king and everybody can see him. You do this, you're going to die. This was not permitted. Mordecai, he's looking at it, he's thinking, I'm going to die anyway. I'm going to stay right here in front of the king's gate. I'm going to let him see that this hurts me. And he's crying out to God in prayer. This isn't removed from us today. I've seen different things happen right here in our country. Different laws passed that have grieved me to my very core. That have come against my Christian faith and the teachings of scripture. And we get mad and upset, but Mordecai has the right idea. He didn't go and protest. To the contrary, he fell down on his knees and he cried out to God, Jehovah. And he said, I am hurting. I am hurting. God, where are you? I can imagine this prayer, can't you? If I was Mordecai and I'm there, I'm telling God, I've been faithful to you. I was faithful to you in all things. God, I was faithful to you when you weren't there for my family. When I did not see you, I was faithful to you. God, I look back at my family, my grandfather, my father. They were faithful to you, and we were in captivity, and we stayed in captivity. God, I was faithful to you when we were here in Susan, and you took away the daughter I've only known. You took away Hadassah. You allowed them to change her name to Esther. God, you allowed me to save a wicked king only to turn around and have that king want to kill me and kill all your people. You can imagine his prayer saying, God, it's not fair. Why are you doing this? Why are we here? And the whole time, God has a plan. And we know the story. We know what happens. But put yourself in Mordecai's position. It's happening real time. And you can't see the end. And you're just saying, God, where are you? Where are you? We look at everything going on in our world today. We ask the question, God, where are you? The fact of the matter is God is where he always is. We simply forget that God has a plan. That I walk by faith. I'm not supposed to see. I'm supposed to obey. I'm supposed to obey. It's no different than what we tell our children every day of the week. My kids will ask me. They'll ask me all the time. Dad. Dad, why can't I do this? Dad, why did you say no? And I might, I might be generous. I might give them a reason that day and say, I said no because of this. And then they'll follow up and ask me, why? And maybe, if I'm feeling really good, I will continue to try and explain to them exactly what is going on. And then I'll get a follow-up question. Why? Parents, you know how this works. Eventually, I get so frustrated, and I just look at them, and I'll tell them one of two things. Either I'll say, because I said so, which is a classic parenting line, or I will tell them, because I am your dad, go away. And that's how it works. God looks at us, and here's what he tells us, because I said so. We're the kid. We're saying, but why? But why? Only God never tells me to go away. God just reminds me, I'm God. Trust me. Trust me. You are to be obedient to me. I love you. I care for you. I've got you in the palm of my hand. Obey. And that's what God tells us. Here, Mordecai, he sees what's going on. He's grieved by it. He knows it's wicked. He's got all these things heavy on his heart. He refuses to go away. He refuses to cover up. He, can, he refuses to hide his grief in any way, shape, or form. And then, when 
Esther sends back her servants again to speak to Mordecai and to try to convince him to go away. This is what Mordecai says in verse 13. Mordecai told them, Answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any other Jew. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But if you and your father's but you and your father's house will perish, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now listen to this. Mordecai's asking Esther. He's saying, I want you to go to the king. I want you to tell the king that he's got to stop this, that things got to change. Esther's telling him, I can't do this. If I go to the king and he doesn't want me, I'll be killed. He'll kill me there on the spot. Mordecai's reply shows such tremendous faith. Because he tells Esther, he says, you're not safe. You're not safe in the king's palace. But he said, even if you should refuse to do what God is commanding you to do, God will raise up somebody whom I do not know. This is essential what he's saying. He'll raise somebody up whom I've never met. I have no idea who it would be. But God will raise up deliverance for us from somewhere else. Mordecai's faith is completely in God. It's not completely in Esther or the king or any man. His complete faith is in God. He says, even if this doesn't work, God's going to work in another way, shape, and form. We will be okay. But he says, for you, maybe you were brought here for this moment. Maybe you were here for this moment. You see, oftentimes for us, we look at our situation and we kind of bemoan the fact and we say, well, I wish I was born back in these days. I wish I was born back at this time. This would have been a lot better. You know, evil has existed in every generation in one form or another. There has been evil or a trial to overcome in every single generation. It's no different now than what it was before. The only difference now is that the, major the majority is vastly evil. And now we are in the minority, at least in modern times. But the minority does not matter when God is on your side. Israel has always been the minority. But yet God raises them up every single time. He took the weakest in the world to show that He is strong. And now God looks at you and I and He says the same thing. He says, I'm going to take you and I'm going to show everyone how strong I am through you. Through you. I'm going to show them. But you've got to be faithful. Just like I tell my children, I tell them all the time, I said, one day you're going to be the dad. One day you're going to have kids asking you why, why, why. One day you're going to have kids annoying you and testing your patience and pushing you one way and another. And you're going to have to be the one that's strong telling them, trust me, I've been there. I've been at your age. I've been at your stage. I know what you're going through. I've got your back. And they're going to have to trust you. Right now, you are my child. And you've got to trust me that I'm going to take care of you. That I'm going to walk with you. That I'm going to watch over you in life's journey. God tells me every day and he's telling you, you've got to learn to trust me. I'm your dad. I'm watching over you. You're going to go through the fire. You're going to go through some hard times. You're going to love those who hate you and you're not going to see the benefit for it. But I'm going to show you where the benefit is. You're going to have to trust me. And this is the lesson all throughout the story of Esther. When we continue to read in her story, we see where many miraculous things happen. And what is even more miraculous than the obvious is that through the whole story, Esther comes up in favor along with Mordecai. Neither one gets pushed down lower than where they start. From the very beginning to the very end, they only rise in favor with those around them, those who are watching. And by the end of the story, by the time we get to the very end of their story, if you jump on forward over to chapter 9, it says in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now in the twelfth month is the month of Adar. On the thirteenth month the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. 
the opposite occurred, and that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. Down to verse 3. The officials, the provinces, the satraps, the governors, all doing the king's work, helped the Jews because, they, because the fear of Mordecai fell among them. For Mordecai was great in the, in the king's palace. His fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Come on down to verse, thir or verse 12. It says, Then the king said to the queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Susan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What, what have they done in the rest of what they've done in the rest of the kingdoms and the provinces. Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Susan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. And it was done. That was my words, but it was done. Then if you go on to chapter 10, verse 3. For Mordecai and the Jews, for Mordecai the Jew was second to King Osiris and was great among the Jews, well received by multitudes of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. Throughout this story, from beginning to end, God was creating God was creating something that no one could have imagined. He brought Mordecai, a captive, a third generation of captivity. And he raised him up through adversity to being second in command only to the king in the province of Persia. And Esther, an orphan whose parents had died long ago, being raised by an uncle in a foreign land, with no hope of any real future, becomes a queen, queen of such great influence that she not only interceded for the Jews and allowed them to fight back against their enemies, but then was given permission to allow the Jews to further annihilate their enemies and kill all the sons of the man who plotted to destroy the Jewish nation. Look what God did during a time of such heartache and pain. Look what he did. Mordecai in the very beginning had almost no reason to trust God at this time. From everything we read in this story, life had gone against him in every way, shape, and form. But the more he trusted in God, the more he depended on, the fa on his faith in Christ, God continued to raise him up. For Esther, her submission to a wicked authority at that time, but never yielding her faith, but trusting in God, allowed her to come to such prominence that she saved the Jewish people. Now imagine what God wants to do with His church if we trust Him. Imagine what God wants to do right here if you trust Him. Church, I relate to these stories. I mean, these stories touch my heart right here. Because in so many times in my life, I have felt very much like Mordecai. Well, everything has come against me, and you just think, God, why? Now, seriously, did you ever think that before in your life? God, why? Music can go ahead and start coming forward. Boy, I tell you what I have many times. I love the Lord. I love Him. I serve Him faithfully. But there have been many times I've asked the question, why? And God just comes back and He tells me to trust Him. Sometimes going forward, I trust Him in tears, not really understanding what I'm doing, but just know I've got to trust Him. There's nowhere else to go. And in the very end, God has always proven faithful. He's always proven Himself to be God. But part of my faith as a Christian, it's not just happy clappy. It's not just coming forward on Sunday morning and raising my hands and shouting out how great life is because sometimes it's not that great. It's not about just telling everybody 
how wonderful things are going in my life and how God has shown himself to be amazing. Because while God is always amazing, I don't always see it right away in my life. There are many times where I just have to put one foot in front of the other and say, God, I trust you. Here Mordecai is. I I can't get this picture out of my mind. He's sitting in front of the king's gate, clothes torn in sackcloth and ashes, holding a decree from a king whose life he saved imagine maybe the tears running down his cheeks thinking about raising a young girl and knowing that her life is about to be extinguished knowing that he's not going to live past this certain time and he's just sitting there reading this decree saying my life's going to be taken from me and I'm under orders from the king that I can't even fight back and he calls out to God and now he has to look at his, at his daughter. And he says, I need you to go to the king. I need you to go plead our cause. She tells him, Dad, if I do it, I'm going to die. You just take a moment and look at the scenario. If you do nothing, you're gone. You're dead. If you do something, odds are you're dead. You're saying, God, all I can do is trust you. I'm going to put one foot in, the, in front of the other. And I trust you. Today, right now, we hear a lot of Christians all around us. We hear them all across the country. And they all say the same thing. We're living in the end times. It's almost become a cliche at times, hasn't it? We've heard it so much for so long. We're living in the end times church if that is true and I believe it is I do believe that is the truth then what else is it going to take for us to fall on our knees and call out to Jesus Christ what more must happen to drive us to our knees Mordecai hit that point he hit that point where the only place he could go the only thing that was left to him was to go down on his knees Because there was nowhere else to go for him. He couldn't run away far enough, fast enough. He couldn't dig a hole deep enough. He couldn't raise an army strong enough. The only place that he could go was to his knees. That was it. And the only place you and I can go today right now is down on our knees. There's no other place to go. And there's no better place to be than on our knees. As a Christian, we walk by faith. I tell my children, we walk by faith. As bad as it is for me today, I think about what it will be for them when they get older. If they cannot learn to walk by faith today, they are in trouble tomorrow. And they are looking for their dad to say, Dad, what are you going to do? Hadassah was looking to her Jewish father, Mordecai, because she was scared. Mordecai, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to be down on my knees in front of this this palace. She was scared even at that. Don't do that. You're going to make it worse. How much worse can it get? And he said, Hadassah, this is what you do. Don't think the kingdom will save you. They've turned against you. This is all you can do. And he says, you were brought here for such a time. For such a time as this, you were brought here. But even if you won't do it, God will prove faithful. But to put it in my words as if I were talking to my daughters. But sweetheart, let it be you. Don't let God go to someone else. Sweetheart, walk by faith. Let it be you. I challenge all of you today. Let it be you. 
let it be you. Let it be you that walks by faith and sets the example for your kids and grandkids. Let it be you that sits out in front of the king's palace in sackcloth and ashes calling out to God. Let it be you that has faith when all else has failed. Let it be you to stand in the gap and say, Father, please, today I need you. Whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for, anything God has laid on your heart today, if you're someone where you just want to stand in the gap for a family member or a loved one, this is the perfect place to do it. If you're someone today, you just say, Pastor, I want to pray for my nation. Boy, do we need the prayer. We need it now more than ever. Come pray for your nation and pray for your church. If you're someone today, you just say, Pastor, I need a closer walk with Jesus. I need Him closer than ever in my life then come build that relationship with your Savior. Whatever need you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for, anything God has laid on your heart, I invite you this morning. This altar is open for you. Please come.